live on Facebook. It's already live. Yep. Okay. I, know. I just forgot to look at something. Okay, cool. Make sure my phone is turned off. Facebook is working. Okay. Do you have Cubase? Cubase. We normally have Juan here that does all this for us, but he was not able to to make it. He has to work for a living. Yeah. It's ridiculous. Like it's not set to 1 on Cubase. All right you are, Adam. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. Let's do it. Are you ready? I am. Go. Okay. Okay. When are you ready? Stand by. <laughs> I did click the button. See, it's playing. See that? Mm hmm. I wonder why we're not hearing it. I don't know. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. It's frozen on Facebook. What is going on? Is the audio, that green audio button on? Is that what's causing the issue? What? That green audio button? I wonder why we're not hearing it. <laughs> no, that's not the issue. Okay. See, this is why it's always nice to have one here. show is about to begin. If you're looking for a dull, feel-good religion, or clap your hands, <laughs> sit around the campfire, kumbaya, you've come. Did you turn that off on purpose? Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. It wasn't set. There you go. I mean, I'm just setting it to what it was already set at. See? Boom. Okay. Okay, we are now ready. For some reason, now we're ready. <laughs> Even though I didn't change anything. But, so but it's working now. And Facebook is working too. Yeah, everything is good. Okay. Praise God. Catholic Man Show, Bishop Condola edition, take two. Warning, the Catholic Man Show is about to begin. If you're looking for a dull, feel-good religion, or clap your hands, sit around the campfire, kumbaya, you've come to the wrong place. We are dealing with toxic levels of authentic masculinity. I would say good luck, but luck is for payments. <laughs> Welcome to the Catholic Command Show. We're on the Lord's team at the winning side, so raise your glass. Adam Minahan here, sitting in studio with David Niles. Dave, it's been a while since we have I know. recorded, since you've been on your vacation. How are you? I'm doing well. We're, we're uh, missing Juan today, but it is okay. We have figured out the buttons for the most part thus right. far. Things are going okay, and we have a very special guest. This is a uh, a different episode. We're not going to do our the three things we normally do today because we have a lot to talk about with uh, our bishop, the shepherd of the flock, Bishop David Conderla. Th thanks for coming on. Sure. Happy to be here. How did y'all get James Earl Jones to do your open? <laughs> <laughs> we had a guy who sounds like James Earl Jones do it. <laughs> yeah, that's actually my sister. She does a really good impression. <laughs> 
but so Bishop, I'm so glad that you uh, uh, were able to come on to the show today. Mm-hmm. It's it's we're we're excited to have you. We've been wanting to actually do this for a long time, being that you are uh, does do the family life direct for the USCCB, and so we were going to talk about that. But then you threw out this, uh, put together this opportunity to talk to you about a different thing. Mm-hmm. So we'll have to have you on again to talk about family and marriage life at a di- later time. It's the Defense of Marriage and the Dark Arts Committee. The, in the Dark Arts. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I hear the name of our committee, I think of Harry Potter, which had a class mm-hmm. in Defense of the Dark Arts. Right. So this is the Defense of the Marriage and Dark Arts Committee. <laughs> <laughs> well... That's kind of like what you're up against. <laughs> yeah. That's what it seems like sometimes. Sure, but, Bishop. You, how long have 2016? 2016. So you just had you just five had your years anniversary as a bishop not too long ago. That's right. right. On the 29th was the fifth year anniversary of the ordination. I guess I got here a couple of weeks before that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Dave and I actually did the 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 play by play of your ordination. I remember you had. Uh, our guy from uh, Dennis Maka from yep yeah and, and Thaddeus Romanski yeah and Thaddeus yeah that was awesome that was the first time we ever were on live radio oh is that your, right your mm-hmm. ordination yeah oh how about that it yeah was pretty cool yeah I was super nervous <laughs> I don't know I don't know how you were feeling you know during your ordination I was nervous well I wasn't thinking about the radio <laughs> <laughs> that's good <laughs> so um, Bishop you put out a letter. Uh, on the reception of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to thank you for putting out this letter. It's uh, something I think should, I I wish more bishops were were doing that. Um, Mm -hmm. We're not here to talk about what other bishops are doing, Um, but I just think it's something that provides clarity for the faithful. Um, It is also um, something that helps people understand what we believe as Catholics, and and especially for Catholics, because there's a lot of Catholics who don't know Mm -hmm. And don't understand, especially when it comes to a subject like the Eucharist, what does the church really teach? Why does she teach it? Mm -hmm. Um, So if you wouldn't, if you would mind, uh, what was it that made you want to put this letter out? What what prompted you to do this? Well, I would say in a general way, just to talk about bishops and, and how bishops decide what to publish or not publish and so forth. That even for myself, uh, because we live in this strange time when media often works against us, and what I mean by that is people's use of it and people's reliance on it uh, can work against us. So something that for 50 people is a huge issue because they read all about it and they're all enthralled with it online and so forth. Maybe for the rest of the diocese, it's not an issue at all. Um, so, and if it, and and things get uh, hyped up mm, yeah. in the media. And so that also plays in. So for myself, I generally don't react to things that happen immediately. And the blogosphere and the, Facebook and all the things can blow up when something happens or some new thing comes out or something, something. But it's almost always the case that we don't find out what actually happened for a week or two. Right. (laughs) And the initial reports are almost always erroneous in one way or another. Even even well-meaning people can get things wrong simply because they speak too quickly before they know what's going on. Mm Mm-hmm. And so uh, when, when people don't see something from their bishop that they think the bishop ought to be saying, they need to think about that. They need to consider that he may have a, a, a strategy in mind, um, or he may simply think that this is not something that really is going to be a big deal except for a small group of people, something mm-hmm. like that. So, uh, you know, this issue regarding uh, communion for people who are supporting abortion, one way to think of it and to think of the, the way the bishops reacted at the meeting that we had and the vote, which still showed 50-some bishops voting against the document on the Eucharist and so forth. 
um, one way of thinking about it or one way of understanding it is like two parents who have children, one of whom has misbehaved. The parents are in complete agreement that that behavior cannot be tolerated. But they're in big disagreement about how to handle that. Mm. Uh, what do we do to make that behavior not be tolerated? And part of their disagreement is the effect that it will have on the child who's committing the behavior. But part of their disagreement may also be the effect it will have on the other children, what they do or don't do. And so I would put this kind of, uh, this, this latest uh, issue in that category. There's not a bishop in the country who doesn't believe that abortion is a grave evil. Uh, but what to do about it, and specifically what to do about uh, political figures or other public persons who claim to be Catholic and yet support it, there's disagreement about what to do about it. What's the right approach to take towards it? And certainly online, there's very hard and fast opinions about what to do about it. But then that may be precisely why a bishop pushes back, because he sees all that going on online, and it sort of runs like a wildfire, like a grass mm -hmm. fire. And he may feel like, you know, this really needs to be tamped down some. People are getting carried away or something like that. So, so all of that was going on in the immediate before math and after math of the bishop's meeting in my mind and so i eventually got around to putting this uh this letter together but i did so a couple of weeks later mm -hmm. uh, things had almost well had fallen out of the news there's another problem with the news and another problem with the media is things go into it and come out of it with no real logic or rhyme or reason uh, as we know the news is often censored these days so stories that ought to be in the news aren't in the news mm -hmm. and stories that shouldn't be in the news you know i look i open my news app and i say what's the narrative today mm, right because people are selecting that uh, so so anyway it was a couple of weeks later when when uh, i finally got around to thinking this issue through and trying to simply think it through from a, a Catholic lens and a practical lens, because the issue really is practical. All of us who attend Mass and who want to receive communion are under the same need to examine ourself, uh, to, to examine ourselves to see in this moment, am I properly disposed to receive Holy Communion. If we believe what we say we believe about what it is that we're going up to do, then we should have some trepidation. Even though we love the Lord, fear of the Lord is holy, we're told in Scripture. When I was a little kid, I remember one time, <laughs> me and a couple of buddies got together and we had broken a thermometer and we had mercury and we had it in our hands and we were playing with it and playing with the fact that it forms little beads and balls and it rolls around and separates and goes back together. It's toxic. You can absorb it through your skin. Right. <laughs> we didn't know that. If we had known that, I'm not sure that we wouldn't have done it anyway. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> that's the way little boys Because it is awesome. <laughs> what, yeah. That's the way little boys are. Um, no, if we had known that, we probably would have had much more respect for it, uh -huh. afraid to touch it a little bit, uh, etc. So I think that's an apt analogy. When we receive Holy Communion, we're not receiving a wafer. We're not receiving something that is benign. God is not benign. Uh, our relationship with God, if we're living it actively, is not benign. It's causing things to happen. And so a person who is supporting a grave evil is not properly disposed. Right. Right. So when we get back, we're going to continue talking about the letter that Bishop David Connerly put out called, Lord, I'm Not Worthy. 
We're here with Bishop David Condola, Bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma. We'll be right back. <laughs> okay. We good? We got, we got three more. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. I didn't know we had bumper music. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> it gives you, so when you hear it, we, that means we got 30 seconds right. before right. Bishop, we fancy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, you ready? Yes, I'm ready. Yeah. Yes. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with the Adam Minahan. Our special guest is the very reverend Bishop David Hondrela, Bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa in eastern Oklahoma. Most. Most reverend. My apologies. Not very reverend. That's for <laughs> bigger that's generals. For vicars and such. And rectors. That uh, bumper uh, music reminds me of Stevie Ray Vaughan from Austin. You like it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, we absolutely. dig it too. Got a good bluesy feel. Yeah, that's right. When yeah. we first started this, we started this uh, podcast five years ago, a radio show, and I was pick, picking out this bumper music. I'm really excited. I was really excited about it, and I hadn't shown, heard let Davey listen to it yet. And I said, either he's going to think I'm absolutely crazy, or he's going to he's going to really like it. So I played it, and then I said, "And welcome to the Catholic Man." You know, I went into it, and I said, "What do you think?" And he's like. Yes, this is it. I mean, if you don't like the blues, you just don't have a <clears throat> you don't have a pulse. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just right, right. Yeah. Okay, so we're talking about the letter that you put out. Uh, we we're talking about the importance, like what your thought process was as you were going mm -hmm. into reading it. Mm -hmm. uh, the diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma is a very unique diocese insofar as we have uh, we're a mission diocese, mm -hmm. uh, roughly about four percent Catholic throughout the whole diocese, mm -hmm. and so, but there's a lot of uh, really. Um, Jesus loving Protestants out there that mm -hmm. uh, we're on the same level as far as Jesus is our savior. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible is uh, the word of God. You know, so we have a lot of common ground, but communion is one that is, uh, there's some differences there. And so mm -hmm. a lot of times I see that, th that. And abortion. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's a good point. And abortion. Um, but a lot of times I see that uh, Protestants aren't sure exactly what we believe and why we Mm -hmm. Why do we believe it? So if we don't define what we believe and, and, and talk about the importance of it, it's everything. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't act like that way, then it's hard to evangelize them and for them to believe that we believe that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you often have cases uh, in which somebody in the family or somebody's friend, you know, you'll have young people who bring their friend to mass. Which is great. Which is great. Mm -hmm. But then they can't receive communion. And they feel like they're being rejected mm -hmm. because in their church, everyone can go up and receive if they have, if their church celebrates something like a Lord's Supper, everyone can go up and receive, but their church may not believe what we believe about what communion is. And if, uh, quote, Holy Communion in that church is intended as a symbolic representation of the Lord's Supper, then of course everyone can receive because it's just that. It's just a symbolic representation. But in the Catholic Church, we believe that something mystical and supernatural occurs in the celebration of the Eucharist such that what begins as bread and wine are transformed by the power of God into the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ in a sacramental way, which is a way of saying in a manner in which we don't see the change, it still looks like bread and wine, it still tastes like bread and wine, but we believe that it has become the most sacred element in the universe, the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And if people really understand that, or if someone who's not Catholic who comes to Mass understands that we believe that and that they don't believe that, then they would themselves, I think, realize and understand, well, gosh, I shouldn't, I 
shouldn't approach for that. I shouldn't approach to receive that. That's not something I believe. Um, and so the same is true, though, for someone who claims to be Catholic. If you claim to be Catholic, but in fact your belief about the Eucharist is essentially that it is symbolic, then you're not in full communion with the church because you're not believing about the most sacred element the church has, the same thing the church believes. And if you do say that you believe what the Eucharist is, what the uh, body and blood of Christ is, and you believe that this, um, this issue that the church has defined as being intrinsically evil is not, or in some circumstances isn't, or whatever, then it's a similar thing. You end up taking Holy Communion in a state of being uh, not ready to receive Holy Communion, and to thus, as Paul said, uh, in his letter, you may be eating and drinking judgment upon yourself mm -hmm. because you're taking something that is sacred as if it weren't. Yes, I mean, and so I talk about this. I mean, the, ultimately, the point of denying someone communion, why, why would we want to do that? It's always and only medicinal. Uh, we would not... It is not to say, we, we never want to say, that person can never ever again receive Holy right. Communion. We might be forced to say to someone, you should not receive now, you shouldn't receive today. Here's why you should examine yourself to see in your own mind and heart and conscience, are you able to change what you believe about X, Y, or Z? so that you become in communion with the church. When you are able to be in communion with the church, then you receive. Um, another thought, uh, you know, practical thought experiment to, to be able to see it. Imagine the father of a family who believes that he can still go out with other women, women other than his wife, and at the same time, he can still come home and have supper with the family, and they should all be fine with right. that. Yeah. Well, he's wrong, <laughs> right? Yes, and yeah, that, he is wrong. Yeah. But then who's going to say, among people who are now saying the church has no right to ever deny anyone communion for any reason, who's going to say that about that father of the family? Then it becomes clearer to people. They're right. more able to see... Okay, that does make sense. He can't simply come home and expect the rest of the family to agree with his erroneous belief about marriage. And the similar thing is happening at Mass with regards to someone who believes that abortion can be justified in some circumstances or must be supported because of political reasons or whatever it is they believe, who does not uh, understand or accept that abortion is an intrinsic evil. And so that's even different than the person who has had an abortion, who has repented of that, who is sorrowful, who has been to confession because of that, who has received absolution because of that. They're 100% different. Yeah, yeah, they're receiving communion again. And it would be the same for someone who right now, let's say a political figure right now who is supporting abortion, even uh, even aggressively pushing abortion, but who comes to say, because of these actions, okay, I see, I see that I shouldn't be doing this. this. These two things are not consistent. And so I'm going to stop doing that. I'm going to stop uh, supporting this evil. That person should receive communion again. Mm -hmm. But not, not if they say, well, I'm going to continue to support abortion, and I dare you. Mm -hmm. You know, right, that right. kind of thing. That yeah. was a silly thing. You know, there were some 60 lawmakers who apparently put some document together. Very childish. That's just simply a childish thing. It's not taking anything seriously. And um, it was it was sad to see that. Yeah. yeah. So, Bishop, it seems to me that there's a lot of similarities between saying, telling someone, you know, you cannot receive communion at the moment, temporarily, you know, whatever. And... Uh, being in a state of excommunication 
I mean, when a person is excommunicated, I believe one of the primary reasons is so that they are very aware they're not allowed to receive communion. You right. know that, right. that is a public. It's more, it's more a formal uh, excommunication. But what are the differences or similarities? You know, because it kind of is sort of like a mini well, a, a mini excommunication. If a, you will. a state of excommunication is a formal canonical event. Okay, and so a person who has been excommunicated for some reason that's the key it's for some reason and the intent is to help them to see you're standing outside of the church now is that where you want to be right. we're not putting you out of the church you right. actually already are there well your your actions are what are putting you outside of the church so come back excommunication is in a sense an invitation mm -hmm. because it doesn't happen until someone has already done something that has put them outside of communion so pointing it out to them through a formal excommunication is is an invitation back we never are going to excommunicate someone now and forever right you're from this day forward you're excommunicated forever but it's always going to be contingent on are you able to repent of this thing that has put you outside of communion with the lord um the similarities between them uh are only in that a person can't receive communion in both instances. Mm -hmm. uh, but one is much more temporary in a sense, much more fluid, because a person who has committed a, a grave sin simply can repent and, and uh, go to confession and, and they're back to receiving communion. So, but all of it, I think, is, is incumbent on all of us. It's easy to get this issue is aimed at public persons because that's a particular situation. Right. Uh, what makes it particular is that it's public. A person who, uh, let's say, there we go. Okay. Our hold, hold that thought. Hold that thought. We'll hold that thought. We'll pick it up on the other side of the break here with Bishop David Condrilla, Bishop of the Diocese of Tulsa in Eastern Oklahoma, sitting here with David Niles. I'm Adam Minahan. We will be right back. Okay, two more. Oh, there thank you, Jim. Going. Jim is. This is why we pay Jim the big bucks. Yeah. We give we give Jim a raise. Infinity raise, Jim. A coaster raise. <laughs> I raise my glass to you of water. Okay, ready? Yes, sir. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show, sitting here with Bishop David Condrilla, talking about his letter that he uh, released this last Friday, mm -hmm. on July 16th, 2021, on the Feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. Also, she's the, awesome. The seventh anniversary of my consecration to, to Jesus through Ooh, Mary. Ooh, nice. Like, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, but, okay, so you were about to... Uh, we kind of cut you off at the end of the break, but I think actually what you were going to say kind of actually dovetails into the beginning of your letter. Mm -hmm. uh, how you, and I, I love how you started out uh, the letter, similar how we started out today uh, on our podcast, but you're telling a story. You told a, to, to you know, kind of set the tone. You told a, a biblical story. Maybe you could uh, talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Yeah, the letter uses the story from uh, Matthew's Gospel of the tax collector Zacchaeus who is this uh, strange little man apparently very short who had to climb a tree to see Jesus you wouldn't expect him to want to see Jesus he's a tax collector he's um, working so to speak for the enemy the occupying Romans but he does he's curious everyone's talking about this Jesus he climbs a tree and he has some kind of a a supernatural encounter or experience such that on coming down from the tree uh, he repents of what he's been doing the way he's been living 
and he becomes an apostle. It's covered really well in the movie uh, Jesus of Nazareth. They go through that scene really well. And uh, you see the difficulty of the other apostles to accept him. Peter doesn't want to accept him. Peter doesn't like him because this guy's been overcharging Peter on his taxes. <laughs> I so, feel for Peter. I yeah. feel <laughs> So Peter has a personal dislike of Matthew, but he comes to accept him. He, re he sees that this man is repentant. And so they become apostles together. And so that's, that's part of the purpose of the letter was to say that it's easy for us to point our fingers. We're all very good at pointing our fingers at others. But it's, it's essential for all of us to remember that all of us are in need of God's grace about all kinds of things. And if a particular public person is supporting abortion that's necessarily a public act a public thing a public right. event we're going to know about it but that means that person needs our prayer so i've talked about praying and fasting for persons and for their conversion in the letter if we're if we're perfectly willing to write all kinds of snide little facebook posts about them but we're not willing to pray for them and we're not willing to fast for them, then who's really in the wrong? We're in the wrong too. Sure. Mm -hmm. And if we're not willing to examine our own life against the gospel, against the teaching of the church, and recognize there may be things where we also are not living up to the faith as it's preached, then we need to do that, not just talk about others. But because when a person who is publicly claiming to be a Catholic, when that person holds positions that are public positions that are in direct contradiction to the teaching of the church about issues that are of great importance, then the church does need to say something in the person of the bishop because people may be confused. People may be wondering, well, does that matter anymore? I don't know if that's mm -hmm. important anymore. Is it okay for you to be a Catholic? And, you know, that's what they might think. Well, maybe it's okay now. Because we live in a society that, uh, again, the media is dishonest in so many ways, but one of the ways that it's dishonest is in the use of language. And so the media uses terms like uh, pro-choice and anti-choice. They don't yeah. say pro-choice and pro-life. Pro-choice, anti-choice. Well, it should be pro-abortion and pro-life. Right, exactly. So there's there's this uh, this intentional use of language that's editorial in a sense. Um, and that has had the effect or has the effect that people begin to think that abortion is a political issue. And my politicians support it. So what? They support all kinds of other things the church supports. And they're all just political issues. Again, if we, if we exaggerate it a little bit, it helps people to see the point. If politicians began to push for a bill that allowed parents up to six months after birth to decide whether the child should live or not, and if they have some important reason why the child needs to go, there's legal places they can go to to pay someone to kill the child for them. Like maybe they lost their job, you know. Could so, be anything. Yeah. So if we if we put it in a little exaggeration like that, then people can see, no, that cannot be a political issue. That's obscene. That's insane to say such a thing. Mm -hmm. Well, we simply believe there's no difference between the child six months before birth or six months after birth. It doesn't make a difference. It's the same act. Therefore, it's not a political issue. Abortion, though it has become seen as a political issue in our country, is not, in fact, a political issue. It should not be on the political table with any other issue that is political. Catholics can disagree with one another all day long in good faith about all kinds of political issues, but not about abortion, not about life issues. Um, and so that's why this takes on a specific gravity mm -hmm. yeah because what if it was your life 
that was being discussed. I don't imagine you would think that that was a political issue. Mm -hmm. I often have thought that that politicians should be forced to have a live baby in their hands anytime they talk about abortion. <laughs> and that would Whoa, yeah, that would that would calm some of the rhetoric, I think. Right. Maybe even change some minds. I think you're right. I could hear somebody though listening to you right now, Bishop, and say and agreeing with you, but then throwing back at well what about other issues? What about other and, and you guys said political issues. Well what about other non political issues? Um, you know, what about I, I I don't know. I mean, there's other issues out there. I, I don't want to uh, like the really, death penalty. I mean, death, that's, that's what I was going to go. But obviously, going to say, but they're, the they're not they're not equal, right? The death penalty and abortion are not are not equal the, the because th they're they're the same in the sense that euthanasia, the death penalty, they're the same in the sense that uh, they're taking in a, they're taking life, the death penalty, if in fact the person is guilty, is not taking innocent life per se. Uh, but they're different from abortion in that there's an intrinsic evil. We use the term intrinsic evil to describe abortion because the child is entirely innocent and entirely defenseless. There can never, ever be any reason to justify the taking of that child's life. When we talk about the death penalty and the church's teaching on the death penalty, we're saying prudently it should not be used. But because it's tied to self-defense, it's always something that could, in certain circumstances, be justified. Right. Uh, euthanasia, the same. Euthanasia is not something that can be justified. <clears throat> it's like abortion in that sense. But there are complicated uh, cases at the end of life where something may be called euthanasia, but it's not euthanasia. Palliative care is a, is a, a uh, way to support someone at the end of their life when they no longer can, their life can no longer be saved, they're going to die. It's a question of how and when. In such a case, they may be helped with palliative means that help um, eliminate the pain or the suffering that they may be experiencing as they're dying. That can be done. Uh, even, even though knowing it might shorten their life. But, it, it's but not, the, it's, the intent is not to kill them. Right, the, their right, intent exactly. is to ease their pain, right? which right. is a big distinction. That's the That's big, I think, big the big issue in abortion is that your intent is the death of an innocent, right. uh, of an, of an innocent life, um, whereas that's not the case with palliative care. Uh, you know, the death penalty, presu you know, mm -hmm. presumably is not an innocent person. I mean, there's reasons for the death penalty. There's, yeah, there's reasons that we can agree to not use it, especially right. in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, because we have a, an organized penal system. We're able to take people who are a danger to society and keep them away from society and so forth. Uh, unless we go all the way down this defund the police route and all the rest of that. And then we're in trouble. And then we're in trouble. But, um, but there's no reason to kill someone in the United States in order to protect society. So the death penalty is not something that needs to be used here. And because we have a track record of killing innocent people, we, we, we see people uh, occasionally freed from death row because their case ends up being overturned or something. Uh, that also argues in favor of not using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that happened. There was a lot of those when they came out with uh, DNA testing. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh. Turns out you are innocent. Right. Sorry. Yeah. Again, a terrible thing. And, you know, with regards to abortion, anytime we talk about it, we always want to keep in mind those men and women who have lost children in abortion and who regret, uh, who regret terribly that decision. Uh, I worked with Project Rachel for 19 years when I was a priest in Austin Diocese. And, uh, we would say that abortion is sometimes chosen, but it's never wanted. Mm -hmm. And that captures the sense that often someone feels pressured, trapped into uh, this decision, but they don't want to make it and they regret it. But that's the beauty of the Catholic Church, right? Jesus is always welcoming you with open arms, ready to receive you back, ready for you to repent. Right. Uh, and that's... That's what we, we're try, trying to strive for is that to tell people that regardless, Jesus died for all of our sins. Right. Um, there's not a, two, a 
uh, too big of a sin to be forgiven. Right. So, we'll be right back. Yeah, we can pick up on that in the next segment because yeah. they do often think it's unforgivable. Right. That's important to mm-hmm. to give. We're, we're uh, people of hope. Okay, mm-hmm. ready? Go. Yes. Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles, here with Bishop Condorla. We're talking about the letter he put out on the reception of Holy Communion uh, with regard to political stance of abortion. Um, or the non-political stance, not political. The, mm-hmm. y- yes, I meant politicians, Polit- public offices. Public, yes, people who are holding this position. Well, the, the distinction is real because, of course, there are there may be people in the pews who say... Under certain circumstances, they support abortion. No one will ever know that because they don't tell people or whatever. That's different than the politician who's taking public stance, right? Or the famous actor or the you know speaker for whatever, some public person who's taking a public stance and still claiming to be Catholic. Uh, we we were mentioning uh, post abortive healing at the end of the last segment. It is the case, it's, it's actually fairly common to be the case, that post-abortive mothers and or fathers can think of abortion as being unforgivable. One of the reasons why it takes some people so long, because the average length of time is about 12 years between the abortion and the time the person finally approaches the church for some kind of healing. Wow. Um, one of the reasons why that can be so long is if they think that it's unforgivable. Mm. Scripture talks about an unforgivable sin. This must be it. But that's not the case. The, the only sin that's not able to be forgiven is the one that's not confessed, the one that's not right. repented of. Uh, God does not force our repentance, but God desires our repentance. So anybody who's post-abortive can approach the church. We have multiple means to assist them in being able to understand the gravity of what happened, which they do, believe me, uh, to repent of that sin, to confess the sin, to be absolved of the sin, and then to work on healing the grief that comes from the loss of the child. Because those are two separate things. That's another thing that people get confused about. If, If I have had an abortion and I confess the sin of abortion and I'm absolved of the sin of abortion, I'm absolved. That's done. But I may still feel a terrible, terrible burden and weight and grief and sorrow. That's not because of the sin of abortion, because I'm still guilty of the sin of abortion, but that's because I did lose a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can't, a person... A thinking, feeling person who understands I've lost a child can't just do that without some sense of of, uh, grief. So there is also a need to grieve over what happened. And that also uh, the church is equipped to help people do. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have various retreat means and and, uh, uh, forgiveness processes. Project Rachel is one of them that I worked with. And those are very effective. So, uh, Bishop, ultimately, in your letter, just so that we actually come out and say it, you did, you do come out and say that a public official who supports abortion publicly should be denied communion. Well, so there's a process there too, and that's something that the faithful are are um, being confused about. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people expected the bishop to go in, the bishops to go into their last meeting and vote together as a block to condemn the president or something. But it doesn't work that way. Our church doesn't work that way. Every bishop is the pastor of the people in his diocese. If the bishop knows of some public person who is taking a public stance in favor of abortion in his diocese, then he has an obligation to reach out to them, to ask, to visit with them, to talk with them about it, to try to understand where they're coming from, why are they doing that, to try to help catechize them to help them understand the gravity of of 
what abortion is and how the church understands it to see if they're able to repent of that, to, to be able to change their understanding of it. And only if they're not, and only if they obstinately refuse to change their stance or stop receiving uh, the Eucharist, only in that circumstance should the bishop step in and publicly, or not publicly, but step in and uh, sort of forcibly deny them the, mm -hmm. the Eucharist. That decision to deny someone communion is not going to happen in the communion line where a person is coming up and the minister is trying to decide, should I or shouldn't I? It doesn't happen that way. It never happens that shouldn't happen that way. Um, but the bishop may have to inform the person, you know, we've had this conversation. You've told me that you're not willing to uh, change your stance on this. I've told you that you shouldn't receive communion. You continue to receive communion. I'm now instructing the pastor in your parish that you are no longer to receive communion. Then it would go that way. Mm -hmm. But hopefully it wouldn't go that way. Hopefully it would never go that way. Right. Because mm -hmm. the person would come to see this. I can't do this. I can't be Catholic and be voting in favor of this thing. I may have to not vote at all or something. Uh, but I can't vote in favor. I can't do things that protect it. So because part of this uh, situation is the, the whole public aspect that a public support of us of abortion in order to be readmitted to perception of holy communion does a politician have to make a public announcement that they no longer support abortion no i don't think so okay i think they might but but i don't think that would be required they need to uh repent of it and no longer be supporting it and because they live a public life that's going to be evident uh huh. Okay. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, there's many things I love about the, this letter. I mean, obviously you're very clear, you're concise about uh, what we believe as a church. But there's also this, and you kind of hinted at it in one of the other segments. But there's this call, uh, a call of action for the faithful. That as mm -hmm. you as you mentioned, you can't just sit there and be bad mouthing people that you don't like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who are public offices that they can't receive communion, if you're not praying and fasting for them, if you're not, uh, you know, because this is all an act of charity, right? The only reason why we're, we're telling them no about communion is an act of charity. Right. And so we're all talking about trying to get everybody to heaven right. and grow the kingdom of God. Right. Um, what do you suggest? So I'm a guy who's trying to, I need to f pray and fast for, for um, a public official. What do you suggest me doing? Well, I think... How does that look practically? I, I guess? think more widely than that. We need to pray and fast for an end to abortion. We need to pray and fast for the conversion of persons who support it. Uh, that will include public persons. We need to pray and fast for people that we have a particular dislike for. Mm, I and, don't like to do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that, that will sometimes include people we don't know there are public persons who, because of things we see them say or do publicly, we develop a dislike for them. Mm -hmm. We don't even know them. We I never have, met I them. I have a lot of those, yeah. Right. Well, are we not commanded by our faith to pray and fast for them, mm -hmm. to, to uh, hope for their well-being if they're committing some serious evil or harm, to hope for their conversion? Yes, we should do all those things. In terms of what to do, well, our faith is rich with ways to do this. Uh, fasting on Friday has never gone out of style, in, per se, in the church, or abstaining from meat on Friday or some other little sacrificial act, um, praying the rosary, praying the chaplet, uh, offering simple prayers. You know, when I see the person on TV offering a prayer, <laughs> I'm probably offering something. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well be a prayer <laughs> that this person will come to to understand the common good and how to support the common good better than this. And here I'm talking about I'm not. In other words, we may dislike a politician because we have a different political view about political issues. Well, that shouldn't come to the point where we hate them or something. Right. But. 
when we're talking about abortion, we're not talking about a political issue. We're talking about an issue that has been politicized, that has been made as if it were political, but it's not political. It's certainly not political for the persons who are losing their lives mm -hmm. in abortion and right. for the uh, mothers and fathers who are being mm -hmm. harmed by it. It's the most callous thing I can think of to be a political person to support a regime that does so much harm to people just for political reasons. That's a horrible thing. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and one thing we've got just a couple of minutes left. Do you have, I have one, I, one, no, one question. I'll, okay. let you, I'll let you go. So aside from political persons, um, what about just the faithful in the pew? Like, let's just say there's hypothetically, there's a person who is not registered to vote. So this is there. This is not a voting person, mm -hmm. but they believe knowing what the church teaches mm -hmm. that abortion is intrinsically evil and they say no i personally support ab abortion even though they might not be driving people to ha to the abortion clinic you mm -hmm. know they, they're not doing anything just that interior mm -hmm. um, assent. assent to that no i believe in abortion is that is that are we are like bordering on grave matter it's it, an interior assent to a grave evil mm -hmm. so they should not re approach for communion they should study it more they should come to an understanding uh, of what they're supporting mm -hmm. and recognize that's irreconcilable with the faith mm -hmm. yeah okay so just that uh, just that belief alone mm -hmm. is that's kind of what i was thinking but i was talking to another priest from a different diocese yesterday about it and now a person may take for example um uh, a person may have a a, a issue with which they struggle. Yes, I'm glad you said that. That's different. And struggle, I mean, struggle, keep uh -huh. struggling. You need communion to help you to struggle. That's different than a person who simply flat out says, the church is wrong, I'm right, and this is how I'm going to go. Right, exactly. Being resolved against the church, yes. Bishop Connor, thank you so much for sure. uh, hanging out with us this afternoon, or this morning, I guess. We're almost at an afternoon. Uh, maybe you'll come back home and we'll talk about marriage. Sure. All right. You bet. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. At noon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Manly water. <laughs> raise your glass at noon. All right. Well, thank you, Bishop. That was, that was great. Yeah, see, you can get some little slide trays that slide in and out on the table. Then the mic can slide right over. Mm. Oh, that's a good idea. You can sit back and be comfortable. And relax a little bit more. Oh, yeah. That's a good idea. You got any other ideas? <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this for five years, and uh, we haven't thought of that one, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Awesome. Thank you. Yes. No, thank you. Okay, Bishop, before you go, could you play some